0.1%. That's the participation rate of American citizens in a distance run. Put that in perspective, that means that in a group gathered people this large here this morning, it's very unlikely that we have anyone who has ever participated in one of the 70,000 plus events which have been clocked for nearly the last 40 years. Now, I know for a fact that there are our number is a little higher than the national average, that we have quite a few of you who have actually run a distance organized race before. So let's check this morning. If you've ever participated in a race over a 5K, raise your hand real fast this morning. All right? Okay. See, guys, we're doing so much better than the national average. 0.1%. Come on, New Hope. We've got like 0.5% or something like that. Yep. Uh, I've done one several years ago. I don't intend to ever do another one again. Uh, peer pressure is literally the only reason that I ever signed up, showed up, and didn't die. I'm pretty sure that I would have died were it not for the peer pressure against me there. I have literally no judgment for anyone who has never run a race like that. But for those who have not or have no intention of ever running one, why not? Why haven't you? I can only come up with two reasons. Uh, they're generic, and I'm sure that there are probably about a dozen subcategories, but these are the two big major reasons, and everything else kind of filters into these two reasons as to why you have not run a race before. I don't want to. All right, that's, that's the only reason. No, right? I don't want to. I can't. Would you agree? Those are the two reasons that people will give as to why they have not or will not run a distance race before. I don't want to. I can't. Now, at the end of the day, that's what it boils down to. I can't or I don't want to. Those are the two reasons why you have not participated in an organized distance race. And you say, Corey, what does it matter? It doesn't. It doesn't matter one bit to me. Running or not running in such a race doesn't matter one iota to me. I care that you're healthy, but I don't care if you're a runner. Actually, I often wonder what our ancestors of 200 plus years ago would think of uh, about us having such events. Wait, y'all gather together and you run for fun? Like you, you put on a costume and do a turkey trot? What is this turkey trot you speak of kind of thing? Aside from personal discipline and overall health, they, they have these kind of races, they have little benefit to you. But here at the beginning of this chapter in the book of Hebrews, I think you'll find that there is a race that we're all called to run, and it has severe consequences for those who do not participate. And I think you'll find also that those same reasons of, I don't want to, or I can't, might be given as to why some say they are not running their spiritual race. By the way, each of those are excuses. They're handled in the author's command for us to lay aside weight and sin and run. In this paragraph, there is only one verb, verses 1 and 2. Only one verb. Some of you grammarians are like, what? Only one verb in this whole paragraph? Only one verb, and that is run in the original language. Run. I don't care one iota about you running physically. I care very much that we are all running spiritually, that we are all signed up, putting in the miles, encouraging one another as we race toward glory. We must run like our eternity depends upon it. And yet, many of us who are running will find that we are trying to do so with luggage and baggage that we are toting along, and this is not running. Let's talk about how the Lord deals with us and our sanctification throughout the Bible. We are likened to farmers, carpenters, soldiers, a family, learners, a flock of sheep, and a building. All, all these are, are word pictures that the authors of Scripture liken us Christians to in our continued journey of faith and becoming more like Jesus. 
We're farmers who sow the seed of the gospel. We're builders who are building a spiritual house. We're soldiers who are fighting the good fight. Family members who are growing in love for each other in Christ. We're disciples who learn better the ways of Jesus every day. We are sheep being led, and Peter even calls us living stones, who are even now being fitted and shaped, placed in the temple of God. Every single one of those parabolic images teaches a different aspect of the Christian life, whether it's patience from the farmer, or defense from the soldier, or our need to be led by a shepherd as we're sheep. But here in Hebrews chapter 12, we were reminded of one of the more popular illustrations of a Christian's sanctification, of a Christian's becoming more like Jesus, and that is a runner. It's one of the most ancient, it's one that most in the ancient world were very familiar with. Whether it was the, the Grecian Olympic Games or the more regional Isthmian Games of the first century, the original readers of the book of Hebrews, they would automatically have been drawn into this illusion of allowing us or calling us to be racers or runners in a race. And so we're drawn into it as well. Look at verse 1 again. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Pause. Time out. In reading those words, you can almost hear the cheer of a crowd and you can see an arena where a race is held. I hope you can. I hope you read your Bible with a little bit of imagination. And by opening the whole chapter with a linking word like, therefore, we're automatically encouraged to flip a page or two and read why therefore or what therefore is therefore. The entirety of Hebrews 11 deals with great stories from the Old Testament saints. For 40 verses, we are regaled with stories of Noah, who built a boat because of the direction of God's voice in spite of what he saw. No rain. He would have been very surprised at what we are experiencing right now. Never saw rain in his life, and yet God says there's going to come a flood, so build a boat. And in faith, Noah does. We're introduced to Abraham, or we're reminded of Abraham, who believed that he would father a nation in spite of what he didn't have. He didn't even have a son. How could you be the father of a nation if you're not even the father of one son? We're introduced to godly Enoch. He's among the names. He walked so closely with God that eventually the Lord just brought him to glory without him ever even dying. There is story after story listed. The greatest hits album of the Old Testament, someone has called it. And you could come away with the idea that it's going to take a lot of faith in order to run this race. Well, if these men ran like that, I don't know that I can do it because there's so much faith that they had. I'm not building a boat. I'm not fathering a nation. I've never walked with God so closely that he just brings me to glory. I must have to have a whole lot of faith. Well, that's one way to read the chapter. It's partly true, but there's also a handful of stories and characters listed in Hebrews 11 that don't really underline the faith of the individual at all. This morning, Brother Tom and I, we were sitting in the back there and just talking, and he said, you know, there's a whole lot of people in Hebrews 11 that I wouldn't have thought were Christians. <laughs> and yet, they find themselves in the hall of faith. Within these 40 verses, we're introduced to serial adulterers, murderers, those who live in open marriages, cowards, harlots, rebels. Their stories range from the weak, strong man like Samson who fought off 1,000 men with a donkey's jawbone, not my choice of weapon, fought off 1,000 men but wasn't able to say no to even one woman. He unhinged an entire city gate and carried it up a nearby hill, but he only succumbed to the gentle wooing of Delilah. 
We are also told about the heartbreaking tale of Jephthah, the judge in the book of Judges who pervertedly vowed to offer his own daughter as a burnt sacrifice and worship and thanks to Jehovah God. He didn't know the Lord at all. Their stories are all over the place, from the very wicked to the nearly anonymous. This great cloud of witnesses, it's not necessarily a, we ran the, faith, we ran the race of faith and you can too club. Instead, it's a group that could sing a line or two of amazing grace like no one else ever has. Seriously, many of these people in Hebrews 11, they're not heroes to look up to. They are consummate examples of God's lavish grace poured out on sinning and erring runners. And it's very likely that you find yourself here this morning, and perhaps you're in the middle of a season where because of past sin, you hear God's command to run the race before, before you, and you think, I can't. There is no way that I can sign up and run this race because I have all this past sin. I believe that a good strong reason that the Lord divinely appointed these names to be listed in Hebrews 11 is to underline the fact that you can run. In spite of your failures, you still can be faithful to God. In a very real way, these stories are urging us on, pushing us forward, cheering us. As you read Hebrews 11, I hope you sense a great cloud of witnesses who see you right here and are pushing you. Now you can, at very least, the testimony of saints cheers us on, specifically the saints listed in Hebrews 11. Abraham, Moses, Samson, Rahab's recorded history of God's faithfulness, they chant out to each of us to keep on running. But I believe this passage teaches us, teaches us something more than that just their stories cheer us on. I think it tells us that saints who have passed before us look on into our race with particular interest. Now hang with me on this. I literally believe that Hebrews 12.1 teaches us that past saints look into our lives and are running the race of faith with great interest. You can take that statement and you can develop a very unhealthy view of ancestry and praying to ancestors and stuff like that. That's not at all what I mean. I've been criticized for my, for my view on Hebrews 12 in the past, and some have dismissed it as purely sentimental. I mean, who doesn't like the idea of, my grandma's looking down on me, she's cheering me on, and they've just said, Corey, that's... That's not taught in the Bible. It's just talked about here. But this thought is more than just sentimental. After all, Hebrews eleven thirty nine through 40, it essentially says that our race is their race as their stories are integrally linked to ours. It says in verse 39 of Hebrews 11, and all these, these Old Testament saints, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise, God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Now, I don't claim to understand everything, what that means, but I believe that in the grand scheme of things, the church, all those who are in Christ, Old Testament, New Testament, current saints alike, we will one day be presented to Christ as his bride. And for that reason, the saints' perfection and completeness in Jesus, those who've passed before us, they look on in our story with earnest expectation and they cheer us to run. Run. Not so much because they miss us or they want to hug us again, but because they want Christ in his fullness. They long to see the fulfillment of Revelation 19 where the bride of Christ is presented to him holy and pure and so they look on and they encourage us to run all the more today. That's the therefore of Hebrews chapter 12. We're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses who look on expectantly to our journey of faith right now. But read on. Because our response to that is seeing this great cloud of witnesses, the author then says, let us lay aside 
every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Let's talk about this idea of laying aside weights and sin. Whether or not you've run a long distance organized race, whether you like running or you're like me and you hate running, we can all appreciate what's being said here, I think. In our race of faith, we tend to take on extra baggage that if not dealt with, begins to slow us down or worse, distract us from the race. As I said earlier, there's only one verb in, this, in the entirety of this paragraph, and it's run. Everything in this verse, everything in this paragraph, everything in the whole book of Hebrews comes to this point where the author is crying out, urging us to run, run the race. That there are some things that will help us run. Think for a moment about how or about what the long-distance runner looks like. Whenever he gets to actually racing, to actually running, the sweats are gone, the windbag, the leg weights, the weight sled, they are no more. His hair is cut tight, or she has it pulled back. Even the clothes have been measured out ounce by ounce to make sure no extra baggage is carried. The ancient Greeks, who are the inspiration of the Roman games that the author is using here as an example, ran completely naked. I'm not in favor of that, but you get the understanding there of casting off everything. Many would even run without sandals because they were scared that they might trip up or be hindered by them further on in the race, and so they just chose to run barefoot. This term for lay aside is used a handful of times in the New Testament. What I found interesting is that every time it was used in telling a story, it always denoted an eagerness. The old King James actually often translates it cast off. Very quickly, you begin to see the picture of the author of of Hebrews. He's telling us not to waste one second here. It's like the race has already started. We're still holding our luggage. We're still holding down by all this stuff, the weight and sins. And so he says, cast it off, lay it aside, throw it away. What's so interesting to me about this portion of the verse is that it gives two categories of things that so easily ensnare us. Weight and sin. I think it's safe to say that We can understand weights in sin. There isn't room for either of these in a runner's life. Just imagine all that goes into a marathon runner's training. They are masters of diet and exercise. They have the trainer and the nutritionist who come in and tell them what they have to do, what they have to eat, what they can't eat. At very least, they've got some kind of app on their phone that tells them how many calories that they can have or not have for the day and how, much, how many calories more they need to burn and all that stuff. In fact, the average American will spend a small fortune in their lifetime on health and fitness. I believe it's over $150,000 of your or hard-earned money will be spent in your lifetime on health and fitness. I wonder if we do all of that for the physical, do we make similar investments into our spiritual lives? So when the author tells us to lay aside weights and sins that so easily ensnare us, what are we doing now in our spiritual life to guard from those things? It's as if the Holy Spirit is looking into our lives in Hebrews 12, and He's pointing out the stuff that keeps us from running. Remember the excuses that I mentioned earlier? I can't, and I don't want to. Why don't we run the race of faith? Because I can't, we think, or I don't want to. I believe those are the exact same excuses that we give the Lord as to why we have not gotten serious about running spiritual. We are called to lay aside weight and sin. Why do you think that the author gives that distinction? Is there a difference? Is there a distinction between the two, the weight and the sin? I think a casual reading of the text would probably lend itself to most of us believing that there are two categories here. And usually, we read this as 
sin, things which are morally or biblically evil, and wait, things in our life which are foolish or unhelpful to our running a race of faith, distractions. So we tend to say sin is all those things that are morally evil, and wait is anything that's distracting. I think that's an acceptable reading of the verse. In fact, in times past when I've taught on this passage, I've encouraged people to actually personally draw up a graph like this in their life where you actually list the snares of these two categories. I still think it's a helpful discipline to do personally. This is something I think would be good for every single Christian to do, to just get honest. These are the sins in my life that are keeping me from running after God. I have a lust problem, I have an anger problem, I have a pride problem, I have an impatience problem, whatever it might be. These are things that are bogging me down. Those are sins in my life. But then on the other side, you might say, what are some weights in my life? What are some distractions that keep me from actually running the race of faith? Things that aren't necessarily morally evil, but distractions, relationships, hobbies, entertainment, comforts. Sometimes we are so bent on our own comforts and entertainment that we would rather have those than Jesus. And doing an exercise like this where we literally list the things in our life that easily beset us, knowing is half the battle and we might be able to do some work on these. I don't think that's a wrong reading of the verse. And usually, whenever I would teach on Hebrews 12, I've taught on it twice in my 15 years here, usually, I would just regurgitate things that I've always heard, things that I've always been taught, and I would just say, weights, oh, those are distractions. Things that aren't morally wrong, just distractions. They keep you from running as best you can. You see some examples listed on that screen earlier like hobbies. It's not immoral to throw yourself into a hobby, be it woodworking or crocheting, NASCAR or reading, but if it consumes your thought life, distracts you from what really matters, keeps you from living kingdom-minded, running the race of faith, that thing is a weight and ought to be laid aside. That's one reading. But in my study this week, I got into the roots of the word for weight. And I found that it really doesn't have much to do with distractions at all. I found that it doesn't mention hobbies or entertainment. Actually, it's more often translated as dignity, importance, majesty, impressiveness, even pretension. So you know what that means? That means that there are people here in the room this morning and throughout the ages who are not running the race of faith simply because in running, they might not look as impressive as they think they look now. Plainly put, They'd be in that first category of excuses. I'm not running because I don't want to. Your self-image is too important to you. What would it look like if you gave your life to Christ and you actually started living by the commands of Jesus? Man, the guys at work, they would, oh, they would rag you endlessly. contrast of this passage is that of a runner who strips nearly everything off himself in order to run as fast and as far as he can versus someone who's wearing a beautiful flowing robe standing on the sidelines and kind of dignifies himself even more and says, look at that fool running. The issue isn't the weightiness of his garment, but the posture of his heart, which says, I'm too important to run. I don't run because I don't want to. 
The point being, some have not started to run the race of faith simply because it's not in their MO. I've told you this story some time ago, but when I was in college, I preached at the Union Mission in downtown Norfolk, in Virginia, a handful of times. It was an experience. Some of you who have done any of that kind of work, you know uh, it's an experience to say the least. Up to that point in my life, I was either 19 or 20, I, uh, I was incredibly sheltered from some of the harsh realities of the world. I hadn't really ever seen the ugliness of poverty and addiction. I had been on short-term mission trips where I saw it in other countries, but never 10 minutes from my home. You know what I mean? I had a loving family who invested in my education. At that moment, I was in Bible college. I was learning to preach, still learning to preach. And I found myself that evening in a room of about 150 men who were very unlike me in almost every regard. I'd only preached a couple of times, and that was uh, to my Christian school class (laughs) or a group of encouraging church folks. I never preached in a setting like that to people like this. It looked different. It sounded different. It smelled different. Let me tell you that the Union Mission smells different from what I was used to. The vast majority of the men there were homeless. Many of them had severe mental illnesses or were painfully addicted to some substance, one or another. A few of them were just sober enough to be let in for the evening. And they were promised at the mission, you were promised a meal and a cot. The only contention was you had to attend a service before you got either of those. So it was the Lord preparing me. I was the thing that stood in their way from getting a meal and a nice long sleep. That was like my intro to church ministry. I realize I'm the only thing between you and the Mexican restaurant and your lazy boy recliner this afternoon. But I preached. It probably was not that good. I'll go ahead and tell you, I can almost, I can assure you it was not that good. I told the story of Jonah, and I intertwined Jonah's life and mine and his account of disobedience. And for probably 25 minutes, you're like, bring back that Corey who preached for 25 minutes. For about those 25 minutes, I pled with those men who were in the fish's belly, many running from God, and yet the Lord had blessed with another chance. Well, afterwards, I had several really good conversations. I had a few that they went into the prayer rooms to seek further counsel from the staff. In the hustle of it all, the majority literally running off to the cafeteria for the meal, I saw a guy about my age who was walking up. He didn't look like the rest. Honestly, he was a lot younger than the standard age of men there at the mission. His clothes were a lot newer and a lot cleaner. He was more put together. It was obvious that he hadn't been on the streets all that long, but you could see around the edges that he was running. He opened the conversation by saying, and it's not an exact quote, but saying something along the lines of, you and me aren't that different. And he referenced the parts of my testimony about loving parents who cared for him, even a good youth group, even a Christian school education. But it was obvious by what he was saying that all of that was in the past, and he stood there, in front of me for quite some time, and I tried to encourage him to commit his life to Jesus, and he ended the conversation with a simple, I just don't want to. My age, similar background, 
similar opportunities. I don't want to. Get that. He didn't have questions about the veracity of the resurrection of Jesus. He wasn't working through the distinctions between intelligent design or evolution. He wasn't even trying to figure out, is the Bible trustworthy? Can, is this a historical book that I can... No. Those weren't his questions. From my short time with him that evening, it seemed like he understood and maybe even believed some of that stuff. He simply did not want to live in submissive obedience to Jesus. I am not running because I do not want to run. He looked at his life in a union mission, and he thought, no, all of this, whatever it was, all of this, my dignity, my self-importance, this weight is more important to me than running a life of faith. I want you to hear me and hear me well. I mourn him and people like him who are so plain about it and they will just come out and say, I am not a Christian because I don't want to be. But even more dangerous than that is the person who is in church this morning, right now, They've got it all together on the outside. They look right. They act right. They have everyone fooled. They even have herself fooled because if she really got down to it, she doesn't really want to run or be like Jesus at all. She has satisfied herself with a Christian normative narrative of just living a nice life without ever extending herself too much in obedience to the Spirit's urging to run. And so she will sit in church her entire life and never run one step in the race of faith. Run. Friend, run like your life depends upon it. It does throw out the self-important dignity that keeps you from going all in and living as Christ is the Lord of your life. There is no middle ground. Meandering or walking are not acceptable responses to the Master's command to run. You don't say, I want Jesus, but I really want my dignity too. I want Jesus, but I really want to feel important. He is either Lord or he is not. You run or you are dead in your trespasses and sins. I don't want to run because I just don't want to. Similar to that, some of us are here and we are handicapped, as I said earlier, by the sin of our lives that we continue to get tripped up in. In fact, the whole idea of the world, of the word beset or ensnares, it's trap language. You hear that, right? It literally means to surround and take by surprise. And if you've been in Christianity any amount of time, I imagine that you've probably heard someone talk at some point about a besetting sin that they might have. You might have even used that terminology yourself. Usually we mean it as like a particular sin that we too often war against throughout our life. Sometimes your whole life you're battling this one sin. We usually use the term besetting sin to describe some kind of tailor-made sin that you often fall into. Maybe because of natural inclination or predilection. You say, I have a besetting sin. So I can't run. Can I remind you once more of the Old Testament saints that we have in Hebrews 11? Not a one of them are perfect or sinless. Not a one of them have clean or even neat stories. Honestly, some of their sins are so egregious that if they weren't mentioned in such a positive light in the New Testament, I would have assumed that they were not followers of God. 
I mean, how could you read the life of Samson with all of his sexual sin, with all of his taunting sin, with all of his playing games with God's blessings in his life, how could you read that story and think that that joker would make it into the hall of faith? And yet, here he is. The question then is, what do I do with my sin? This response of, I can't. The Lord's telling you to run, so He's going to give you the ability to run. What must you do with your sin? What's the answer? Lay it aside. Cast it off. I think the totality of Scripture informs us as to what this is here. What we ought to do with the weight and sin of our lives that hinder our running after God. And that is to confess and repent. I know that's a super simple Sunday school answer, but it's a biblical one. One that we all need to be reminded of. Confession is agreeing with God about our sin. Namely, that it is in fact sin, but also that it, des that it deserves the full weight of His judgment. Can you hear me on that? When we confess our sin, we're not just saying, oh, what I did was wrong. No, we are saying, I have sinned and I deserve the full weight of God's judgment. Confession means to say the same thing as. That's not what we do though. Here's what we usually do whenever we talk about confession or confessing our sin. We usually say, yeah, lust is a sin, but who doesn't struggle? with this sin. Or, we'll say, yeah, I, I sinned, I, I have an anger problem, but if you only knew my family, if you only saw my dad's temper, you know that I'm a whole lot better than he is. That kind of thing is mere admission of sin and it is not confession of sin. You're agreeing that the thing is a sin, but you're not agreeing with the weightiness of that sin. Rosaria Butterfield writes, when we confess sin, we own it. This means that sin does not come with a defense attorney who provides all the excuses for why what God calls sin is something less than that in my life. Once we call sin, sin, and we agree that God, with God, that sin sends us to hell because Christ took it upon himself, we can then say we turn from it and we aim and our intention is to not return to it again. That's what's meant by lay aside, that you throw it out, that you cast it off, that you leave it in the dust because you have turned and you have sprinted away from it. And the rest of the verse says, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. In case you thought that any of this is easy, in case you've bought into the modern Christian lie which says, come to Jesus and all your problems will just fly away. Come to Jesus and you'll be perfected in like a week or so. Come to Jesus and you'll never have to deal with sin once more in your life. In case you've bought into any of those lies, and many of us have, you have to understand this is a long and troublesome process. It's an endurance race. In fact, there are a couple of words that the author uses in this passage that remind us that this race is not for the faint of heart. In the original, the term endurance there in verse 1, it's a very specific word that involves both patience and persistence, reminding us that we are in this for the long haul. Patience and persistence. If you're like me, I've been a Christian now for probably over 31 years. There are days when I wake up and I feel like I ought to be a whole lot further along in my journey of faith than I am. A few weeks ago, I said, I told you the story about how I was driving down the road and just some thought came bursting into my mind, some evil thought. I have no idea where it came from. I had a friend grab me after service and he said, I'm so glad that that happens to someone else. I don't want that in my life. And it just pops up. 
Do you feel that? You are in it for the long haul, Christian. This race is one of endurance, which involves patience and persistence. Also, it's so interesting to me that the traditional word, the traditional Greek word for race is not used here. Instead, he uses a much broader term, agona. It's the word that we get our English word agony from. He says, let us run with endurance the agony that is set before us. It's so encouraging. The, the Spirit says, run with patient persistence the agony of the Christian life that is set before us all. It's not the most positive and uplifting thought. It's not one that you'll find on many Christian radio stations, but it's better than that. It's biblical and it's real. Run the race of agony with persistence and patience. It is so hard. But look at the prize. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. What's so interesting to me in this text is that you will find that as you run away from your sin, you're also running towards Christ. I know it's super simple, but I know that some of us need to be reminded of the super simple on a daily basis. As we are running from our sin, we are also running to Jesus. Or it works oppositely too. That as we run to Christ, you are running from your weight and sin that you've cast off. That statement alone ought to make us Run for all we're worth. Because the more frustrated I get with my sin and the weight of this world, I ought to see Christ and run even faster to Him. One of my favorite books I've told you before is the story of Pilgrim's Progress. John Bunyan wrote it a long time ago, a couple hundred years ago, when he was in prison. And in the book... He writes about a character. He calls him Christian. He's kind of the every Christian, the every man of of the whole narrative. And he talks about Christian's struggle with knowing that he is a sinner and knowing that where he lives, the city of destruction, will one day end in judgment and flames. And there's this point early on in chapter one where Christian is reading a book and it's telling him all about his sin. And he goes to a man who's named Evangelist. And the man, Evangelist, says, you must run. And Christian says, where must I run? And he says, you must run to the celestial city. You must run to the cross. And from that point on, Christian, with an intense burden upon his back, he runs through the streets of the city of destruction, and he cries out one phrase. He says, life life, eternal life. He runs down every avenue and every byway and his neighbors come out and they call him crazy and at every turn he is leaving the city of destruction and he's calling out life, life, eternal life. He's leaving it behind and he's running towards life. That is Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. You are laying aside the sin and the weight that so easily besets you and you are looking to Christ who's the author and the finisher of your faith and he gives you life, life, eternal life. Those weights and sins in which you find so much comfort and consolation now, all they are are evil excuses of I can't and I don't want to. And here the Spirit tells us, run, Christian. Run for all you are worth. Get Christ. Leave it behind. And life, life, Eternal life is yours to gain. 